The solutions will be posted on the, in eCompanion. And um, well, the first thing I want to say is that you should never skip class because you still have to write two lines of code, and you you're, you know you're afraid you're going to lose points. So, um, and then just don't show off. Well, I'm saying for everybody, um, as a general rule. Um, now, turning, you know, I, I, I highly discourage you to turn in homework late because um, you run the risk of me posting solutions, and then I won't be able to um, to give any um, any um, uh, credit. So, but. Uh, Let's see, so, so I will post solutions here in this area of the eCompanion. So here's where you can find it. Um, and I would have posted by today, but since some of you um, turned, you know, really, really late this first homework assignment, uh, I still haven't done it, but I'll do it right after class. Um, also what I've done, and, and I, I should have done this probably uh, earlier, but for chapter one, for for many of the uh, chapters in this book, um, I have solutions to other problems that I didn't assign for homework. Um, and in chapter one, I have these three problems. Um, and again, if you just look at these solutions, it makes no sense. So you have to look through the problems and see if you kind of need more uh, practice and more work. Um, I think problem number three, which I didn't assign from chapter one, but it still talks about this big problem with a change in assumptions instead of, um, I think instead of linear uh, price drop, market price drop, it's like a quadratic. So it's kind of a different model. And then how this affects the, um, the outcome. Okay. So check this out. I'm not going to make copies of this because um, I've also uh, posted two problems in chapter two. So hopefully that will help you in the in this homework assignment, next homework assignment. Which, by the way, I'm 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 willing to set it up for next Monday if that's um, going to help you. But we will move. Uh, you know, we'll move on. I think to chapter three probably Wednesday, okay? But, um, so these are two problems. It's a different context, so you, it's gonna, you know, take you some time to um, get used to the, I mean, to, to understand the situation. I think number seven and eight deals with, in chapter two. Well, it's a constraint, uh, it's, uh, I believe it's unconstrained and then constrained. Optimization, multivariable. It's a newspaper. Um, I think it's quite interesting situation that you know, kind of realistic about uh, subscription, subscription price, advertising price, and all that. Um, revenues, profits. But anyway, so these are kind of codes or examples of. And uh, let's see. I didn't post the M file to these. Because um, probably it's better to for I mean if you if you really want you could could copy and paste these things but it would be a good exercise I think not to have the M file so you can create it on your own um, certainly I have the uh, I have this um, well in the in the codes. I will have the kind of the the M files and the the published version of each example in the book, but not of the exercises at the end. Okay. And again, keep in mind the solutions are always in eCompanion. If you look if you look for them, um, you know, just out there on the web, you won't find at least not on my website, um, where you have to log in. All right. Um,
So let's see. Any any questions about what we've done so far? Except maybe troubles getting a computer to work with you. We've done we've done a one dimensional. I mean, so far we've done one dimensional, and last time we talked about a very simple two dimensional optimization, right? Yeah. Uh, I will then have them whatever you turn in by Wednesday. Yeah. Um, so we've done a little bit of, two, of uh, multi-dimensional, well, two-dimensional optimization, and that was a color TV problem. If you've been recently in a store, you've probably seen the variety of sizes and prices, right? If, you, if you're in the market for a car TV, you probably wonder who sets who sets those prices, and and somebody does some sort of optimization. They want to maximize their profits. Um, so I think I ran this. Didn't didn't we run this? Uh, the only one th one one thing that I want to mention is you have this multi well you have two dimensional function of two dimensions that you have to let's say maximize or minimize. And you, so this we talked about last time. You you kind of look inside the domain. If there is no constraint, no, you know, constrained region, if you want. Okay, maybe it's constrained to you know the first quadrant because the variables have to be positive. But um, inside of the of the region where the function is defined, you look for the points where the um, derivative where the uh, gradient is zero, right? Where the partial derivatives are, are zero simultaneously. So that's how you solve this. And you get uh, that value, the critical point, or if you want, right? That has two coordinates, x1 and x2. When it comes to sensitivity, those two points will depend on the parameter that you perform your sensitivity to. Okay. In this case, I don't know, was a was a price elasticity, so it was some sort of a change in the assumption that uh, we made of some price drop. Um, and in this case, if I let's say call it A here, then um, these two functions, these two points, the points where the maximum occurs, in this case, was a maximum, right? Although we didn't really check. Or maybe we checked. I forgot. Uh, but it turns out to be maximum from the graph, right? So, or from the second derivative test. So then we look at the um, two values and how do you perform, let's say, sensitivity to uh, to this parameter of the optimal profit of the maximum profit? Because this was a profit from profit again, right? So here we, we perform x1 to a, x2 to a, but what if we want to perform sensitivity of the actual value of the maximum profit to a? Yeah. Exactly. So we take the the two x1 and x the two values, and I'm going to write this in a uh, in a second. But we take these expressions. For the x1 and x2 f the maximum, plug it in the value of the function, right? We get the maximum value. And that maximum value will be a function of, of a only. Okay? So that's not done in this code, but let's let's do it. So I'm gonna take the code, right? And I'm gonna add Probably we did this last time, but uh, let me do it anyway. Uh, y max a is subs in y x1 max, oops, excuse me, x1, x2 with these values x1 max a, x2 max a. If you, if you if you make a typo, if you right, if you make a mistake in calling this, you're going to get an error. So it has to be consistent. So let's just run the whole thing. Uh, 
All right, so I just ran one, so I initialized everything. And now, of course, I didn't see this YMAX, but now I can see it. And I remember we did this last time, right? Um, and then we perform sensitivity to this value. So the point that I want to make is, let me write this down here, is when you perform sensitivity of the optimal value of your objective, So let's have, I have a function of two variables, and let's call this y. Let me call it y. So, uh, needs to be maximized or optimized, right? Or minimized. Then you just you just take the gradient so that's the on components the partial derivative set solve right solve and get x one and x two which could be not just one could be several solutions right you could get several solutions of this not in this example but um, our candidates. for um, max or minimum. All right, so what if um, y depends also on some parameter? So when we do sensitivity, then Here's how it changes. The function depends on, let's call it parameter a, okay? Um, depends on still the x1, x2, and some parameter, right? Let's call it a. And now, do the same thing, right? We solve partial of y with respect to x1, partial of y with respect to x2 equals 0, right? And now we're gonna get we're, what we're gonna get is we're gonna get candidates for max min. But the important thing is they're gonna depend on. So this is gonna be functions of this parameter, right? And then y. is going to be replacing these values in the expression for y and, and getting the optimal value. I use a little hat because that's a very specific, right? It's a specific, for each a, there's going to be a specific optimal value for your ob objective, for your function. Okay? So now, Sensitivity is just, so next would be just taking the derivative and then multiply by a over y hat if you do relative changes, right? So you have to compute this, this derivative. Now, what's this derivative? Uh, going to equal. By the chain rule. Do I dx, dx1 times dx1 dA, and notice that I'm, I'm writing um, you know, partials when there are when I need partials, and I'm not. I don't write partials when I don't need partials, right? So every everywhere a shows up, I need to differentiate with respect to that. So it's partial of y with respect to x1. And really, the I'm not going to write this, but this whole this whole thing here, this argument. In other words, the partial 
is going to be evaluated at this at this point, right? That's how the channel works. And then also here and so forth. But I'm, I'm not writing it, right? Is that it? No, there is one more term, and that's, that's very important. So this is partial of y with respect to a, again, at that point. Okay? So, at, at the point where I have the hats and I, I compute the partials of y with respect to x1 and the partial y with respect to x2, what do I get? What were the x, we, how do we compute x hats? That point where the maximum or say minimum or whatever, critical point occurs. By solving the system, right? So both this thing and that thing are zero. Right, so, oops. So just, just, just this expression is zero. So what this means is So this is when it's unconstrained optimization. So this is unconstrained and um, again if you, I mean this is not just sensitivity as we talked about because you have to take also A over Y hat but this is what, this is the kind of the change of the optimal value with respect to A. Yeah. Well, it is a function of A, but it, it's a function of A through the X1 hat and X2 hat. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You see. So, but so, x one hat of a is a function of of a, which you, which comes from the system. So it really helps to to run the code and 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 see this sequence of things. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. But so it's equal. <laughs> When you have unconstrained optimization, it's like taking the partial of y with respect to a in the, uh, where is that? So what I'm saying here is, is you could do this two ways. One would be to substitute the, y, the x1, x2 with the maximum or minimum point that you found with respect to a, plug it in, and then take the derivative, right? But alternately, what you could do is you could go to uh, to the very beginning here where you have y and hit it with a partial with respect to a. And then evaluate at the heads, where the heads occur. Okay? Right? Because it makes sense to take the derivative of y with respect to a here. Partial, right? So what am I? Uh, so what is what is the actually the um, uh, meaning of this sort of? It may seem a little bit nonsensical. Is um, think about this now partial as being what? Well, this is actually for for very small changes in a. It's just the it's just a change in y. Right. Relative to the change in a. So think about making a very small change in A, then this derivative, which is the um, so 
this is not partial y a times those points, that's those points. No, it's at, the, the at those points. At this point, yeah. It's like the blue thing that I didn't write here. OK? I mean, this thing is going to uh, become very clear when we have constraint optimization. But at this point, you can think, again, as um, the, the, the change or the relative change in the, in the optimal value to the parameter is simply uh, the, the change of, of the original a, of the, of the original function y, when you make, when you make a small change in, delta, in, in, in a. So, so let, me, let me just write that. So this is going to be approximate the change in y over the change in a when the change in a is, is of course, very small, right? So this is very small. Because that's what the partial derivative, that's what the partial of y with respect to a means. Exactly. Elsewhere it would be different, right? But it's, um, it's, in a way, it's like you before you have to, you compute the, the 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 critical points, you know this ratio is sort of the sensitivity. So as as your as your function changes with respect to that parameter, you could just be looking at the value of the function in terms of that parameter, um, and take the, the partial derivative. Okay. This is not going to actually happen when you have constraint optimization, and I'll, I'll show you in a second. So let me, um, let me start um, talking about constraint optimization. And um, that relies on Lagrange multiplier method, which I had a handout, so so I want to bring that handout um, here. Let's not talk about this. Let's see here. Okay, okay so. So I'll just briefly kind of um, mention this, and I'm, uh, I'm going to point to uh, also some lectures that I have from Calc 3 that you might want to, if you want a refresher on, on uh, Lagrange multipliers. Um, but the setup here is the following, is you have your optimization function that, you, let's say, is a two variables, very simple situation, right? Um, and it's defined on, on a bounded region, right? So it could be inside, but also it has a bounded, well, it has a, a boundary in the form of a, in this case, it would be an equation of two variables, right? An implicit equation could be. So I call that g of x and y is equals a constant. That would be a level curve for this function g. OK? So. The goal is to maximize, minimize this function f that lives in this region, knowing that it's possible to get maximum on the boundary. Right? If it gets a maximum inside, then it's it's like being unconstrained because you take the it has the gradient has to be equal to zero at the interior points where to have a maximum. Right? But how about on boundary? On boundary, you could have something that's you know, it doesn't have gradient equal to zero, right? It could be going like a cliff, right? At, at a non-zero tangent, uh, at a non-horizontal tangent plane. Could have a maximum like that, right? Let's say this, you know, the boundary is. So uh, there's a very kind of easy way to see how to locate those maximum points using the gradients not only of f, but also of g. And let's see, why am I saying that? Well, OK. First of all, it's an observation that the gradient vector of a function, it's always normal to the 
level curves, right? And this is true for F, and this is true for G. So for F, let's, I'm just plotting a kind of a sample level curves. And then at each point, there's the, the uh, gradient is going to be normal to that. Okay? Everybody remembers that? Let's see, do I have a, I might even have a computation that, I don't. Let's see, do, do we have to go through this? Why the gradient is, is normal to the level curves of a function? Well, that's one property. The other property is that the gradient is actually the direction of maximum increase of a function. So maximum um, ascent. And of course, the opposite gradient would be the direction of, of maximum descent or steepest descent. Okay, And that's done using the directional derivative. So I think that's pretty standard notation. Directional derivative of a function at a point in the direction of a unit vector u is just the limit as t goes to 0 of this difference, right? So it's like, so what's the meaning of that directional derivative? It says the rate of change of the function f along that direction. And along different directions, it could be different, right? And it's the chain rule. When you want to parameterize this line, and you write what this, what this means, you take a derivative, um, it ends up being the gradient dotted with u, dot product. So if you know how to, the dot product of um, works, then you will know that it's, it's the length of the first vector times the length of the second vector times the cosine of the two. So cosine is maximum when the two are aligned, right? That makes cosine 1. The two vectors are aligned. So when, when, when u is in the direction of the gradient, right? So that's maximum rate of increase. And cosine is negative one, the minimum, when it's opposite, right? So that's that kind of gives you that uh, property that, that the gradient is the direction of maximum increase. What is that that uh, value actually? Well, you just plug in. This is this would be the direction of the maximum increase, and you need to be unit vector. So, so this would be uh, u star. You plug it in your directional derivative, and what do you get? You get actually the, the magnitude of the gradient at that point is actually the rate, the maximum rate of increase. Okay, so again, this is a Calc 3 stuff. So the gradient is very important, right, for, uh, for understanding how a function of several variables um, where it grows, in which direction it grows, and how fast it grows. Okay, so what's the method of Lagrange multipliers? Mm -hmm. Basically says that if you have a function of, let's say, it doesn't have to be two variables, but let's say you have that function of two variables defined on a curve that's given implicitly by g equals some constant. right? Then at the maximum point or a minimum point, the two gradients have to be, the gradient of f and the gradient of g have to be in the same direction. So they have to be parallel. Uh, you know, another way of writing is a gradient of f has to be a scalar multiple of gradient of g. This scalar is the Lagrange multiplier, right? So how do you do it in practice? Well, here I actually have the, the proof of that. So it's not too difficult to see. Um, why do they have to be parallel? Okay. Well, what would happen if they would not be parallel? So if, if grain of f, well, first of all, grain of g is orthogonal, right? So it's perpendicular to the to this boundary, right? Because that's what the gradient does. So what if the grain of f would not be uh, parallel to that direction? Then grain of f would not be true. 
So you could have, you would have a direction in the tangent, right? You would have a component um, of the gradient in the direction of, of the tangent to that, to that curve, to that boundary, right? So take a look. If you take the uh, direction derivative tangent to, to the curve, which is just the dot, this dot product, this would be strictly positive. Why would it be strictly positive? Because the angle is less than 90 degrees, right? Being strictly positive, what does it say about the f in the direction of u? It says that f is going to increase in the direction of u, right? So you cannot have a maximum at that point. So if you have a maximum, this cannot happen, right? All right. So it's kind of a, of course, and this is true for, for uh, several variables as well. Um, anyway, I, po I pointed to, uh, again, if you, if you want some refresher, um, you can find it in various places in your Calc 3 book or something. But um, let's just go to, you know, concrete example um, and see what it takes to actually solve a constraint optimization. So um, I'll just briefly show you, um, well, point to the problems that you might encounter if you have to do it by, by hand. So if you do this by hand, f, um, let's say f is x plus 2y plus 3z. I'll just take this example that's in the book. Subject to x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals, I don't know, 3. OK. So. Well, this is already a function of three variables, but just to, to recap that method, what do you do? So first thing, what you're going to do is since you only have one constraint, you're going to, let's say, label this even if it wasn't given a name, call it a function, right? Because you want to compute the gradient of this. So if you compute the gradient of f, you need to compute the gradient of f and then make it parallel to the gradient of g, right? So basically that's the points those would be the points where this, uh, there's a chance to have a maximum or a minimum for this function, f. Right? Physically, this, this is a sphere, isn't it? So it's a sphere in 3D. And at each point on the sphere, you have some quantity that has this, right? depending on those uh, coordinates of the points. And you want to find the max and the minimum. All right, so this is a necessary condition for a maximum to occur. And what is the? Uh, gradient. So it's the gradient of f. Uh, one, two, three. Right. So it's the partials. So that's one, two, and three. That was quite easy. What's the gradient of g? 2x, 2y, 2z. Right. So the fact that this three is not doesn't play uh, so far any role, right? So when you you want that this to be, you want these, so you want partial of f with respect to x1 to be lambda partial, uh, actually x in this case. Partial of g with respect to x, partial of f with respect to y, 
lambda partial of g with respect to y, partial of f with respect to z, lambda partial of g with respect to z, and here's what you get. You get 1 equals lambda times 2x, 2 equals lambda times 2y, 3 equals lambda times 3, 2z. That probably brings you memories. Um, well, first of all, let's see. We have three equations, and how many unknowns? We have four unknowns. We have x, y, z, and this lambda, which is the Lagrange multiplier, which is actually an unknown. So, the, so you could find x in terms of lambda, y in terms of lambda, z in terms of lambda in this particular example, right? But what do you do with that? You keep, that, that doesn't mean you've, you've found the maximum minimum points, right? Think about the sphere and that uh, the, the, point, the points where f is constant correspond to what in 3D? x plus 2y plus 3z equals 7. What is that? It's a plane, right, in 3D. And as, as that, the value of f changes, the, it's basically as moving the plane, um, and you're moving that plane parallel to itself, right? And uh, when it hits that sphere, let's say you move it in direction of the gradient, right? So you increase f. The gradient is 1, 2, 3, right? So when it hits the sphere kind of last, that's when it's the maximum, right? So you want to know that point where the sphere hits the, the, so you want a number for x, for y, and for z. So what do we need to do? We actually also need to impose that x, y, and z belongs to that constraint surface. So, so this is the constraint equation, right? g equals whatever that c is. So now, of course, I need to put x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 3. So, all right. And now you go at it. So, anybody remembers what's the peculiar thing about Lagrange multiplier? No? Is a, is a pretty method by hand? Well, just solving this first can be can be extremely difficult, if not impossible, by hand. And the strategy of solving it by hand can I mean changes from one example to another. So, for instance, in this case, what would you do? As I said, by hand, you easiest is to solve for x, y, and z in terms of lambda. Plug it in here and get an equation for lambda. You find the lambda, then you go back and find x, y, and z, right? But this is by no means universal. You can uh, have very simple examples where you have to do something else, right? And in fact, because it's a nonlinear system, so let me emphasize that. Of equations. You know, uh, the, it can it can you know get so complex that you cannot find uh, by hand any solutions. Uh, you could have multiple solutions. You could have no solution, right? For a nonlinear system. Why 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 is it nonlinear? Well, it has the squares here, right? But even this is nonlinear, right? In terms of the unknowns. Okay, so what do you do? Well, in this case, you could do it by hand, right? But um, in the examples that you know we deal with, you try to do it. You know, uh, let's you know maybe ask a computer to do it. So uh, let's see if, if the computer can do it quicker than we can or or not. So you have the solutions, you know, written in the book that, as I said, with the strategy that we talked about. Um, so how would you do it by hand if we had to do it by hand? Now your master is a math lab. Well, 
well, first you have to define the um, variables because we're going to do it symbolically. Okay. Actually, it's not necessary, but why why do we do it symbolically? Any idea? Because later on we're going to have parameters. On top of these, we're going to have parameters that will change the constraint or the function, or both, right? So that's where symbolic is. Well, if you can do it, fine. But sometimes you're going to, uh, the computer will have difficult, uh, difficulty finding solutions, even uh, symbolically. So then we have to run numerically. But um, so we just learn how, you know, whatever. It's possible. So let's let's do the first one. So the first one is well. Why don't we just um, follow the example? I mean, I can I can show you just set up the system. Well, okay, let me show you that. So you can set up the system uh, just simple as as this. So one minus two times. What was it? Lambda times two times x, right? What was the other one? Two minus two times lambda times two times y. Third equation is three minus. Lambda times two times z, and the last one is x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus three. Okay. So the reason I, I define it like this is because I now want to solve the system. So, and remember, in MATLAB you just do symbolically. Uh, you would just do this, right? And it means equal zero. It means that expression equals zero, that expression equals zero, that expression. So, okay. Well, let's give it a try, see what happens. Yeah. Well, that's the problem. No, no. I think that's not what you're talking about. This comes up no matter what you try to solve. Okay, well, um, we need to look at this. I mean, it's sometimes the computer is, you know, can be mis misconfigured or something. But, um, okay, so wh what do you see happening here? Hmm? First of all, we get some sort of symbolic things that it doesn't display anything, right? So, so that's one thing we have to fight. Uh, so, well, we can do the following. We can have. I don't want to go into this. Um, what I like to do is I like to. Uh, I'd like to uh, bring you a syntax that actually we, we, we use in our code. So let's, let's follow this all along here. So we, I'll talk about the, uh, I mean the problem that's behind this code. But right now, just look at the um, code of two variables. I differentiate. I find the gradient, right? That's the optimization function to be optimized, and I find the gradient of g. Okay, and then I just say solve. So it's like I, I asked the computer to do everything for us. Partial of f or y with respect to x1 minus lambda, partial of g with respect to x1, and partial of 
f with respect to um, x2 minus lambda partial of j with respect to x2, right? And g. What is and g? What is g here? There's a constraint, right? So, and, and, and notice that I'm, I'm doing this and then I'm harvesting the output, right? So I'm not just letting, I'm, I'm not just doing this as a solve. What I'm doing is I'm taking, uh, I'm, 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 I'm saving it in some format, right? Now, something very important to, to remember is how do you know what to harvest? So how do I know that when I get when I when I when I ask to solve the solution will be lambda first and not x or y or z. And what's their order? Alphabetical order, okay? So that's important to remember. It's always it comes in alphabetical order when it works symbolically, okay? It's important, uh, maybe here it's not, you know, that, uh, that obvious, but whenever you, you want, you know, an answer uh, and you want to give it names, right? Always you're going to have to ask, Right? I mean, I could have said x hat is the first, y hat, but it would give me the lambda value, right? So, anyway, so that's, these are the lambdas, these are the, the x and the y's and the z's, okay? And you found two values, which you would also find by hand. In fact, I think you can also check with the, it's exactly the same as the book has it, right? For x, y, and z, right? So, I mean, this wasn't really um, difficult. This system was, again, was solvable by hand. So you can imagine that a computer wouldn't have uh, much, much, much problems finding. But anyway, remember this peculiar, uh, peculiar feature. And also how, yeah, the, the, the alphabetical order is going to be, uh, become extremely important when we have parameters on top of um, the variables, the constraint, if we have additional parameters. Okay. Back up your step here, if I just type lambda, will it, will it display the answers? Or it's just, I think I call that. Oh, here? Yeah. If I just typed in lambda, it wouldn't give me the lambda half answer, would it? So, yeah. So, let me, okay, I'll just say this. Um, when you get an output like this, that's called this. This is this is actually going to have fields. These are called fields of this variable. So to actually extract that, what you do is you do a and s. In this case, I didn't call anything. Lambda dot lambda. So it's like, so it's like this a and s. This you can give it a name, right? You can. Yeah, you can give this this name, right? then to, to see what's inside is like an encapsulated thing. If you want to see the x values, then you do this, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it gives it in the alphabetical order. Now, if I, if I have to change that and make, so let's, let's do a very small, a small change. In, um, so now instead of this, so here I had three, right? What if we change this three to, to a parameter and ask ourselves how is that going to change the, the optimal solutions, right? So instead of, instead of this three, let's call it actually, actually C, right, in the code. Now, of course, you should do it at a, at a I mean, you should do it in a, in a, in a script, in a, in a file like that. But um, so all I'm changing is 
Can everybody see this, or maybe I should? The first three questions are the same, and now this one I'm going to change it. Is it going to work? No, because I need to define that as a symbolic first. So let's define that as symbolic. So now I'm performing sensitivity to to that uh, value of the constraint. It's a very important sensitivity. When you have a constraint, and then you change that constraint, right, by some amount. Okay, so now now I can probably define the fourth equation as that, right? And now let's run it again. Now if I just call this, it's going to be a mess. Because now I have five variables, right? So if I don't specify with respect to what variables to solve in terms of the parameter, it's going to take from the end of the alphabet. So it's going to, it's going to do the right thing, right? Because it's going to do x, y, z, and lambda in terms of c. That's what I need. But what if, you did, what if it wasn't c, but it was p? Well, p is, you would actually not solve for it, right? Understand? If the parameter was p, and I didn't specify anything there, it would solve for x, y, z, and p in terms of lambda. OK, so we don't want that. But in this case, it's going to do the right thing. Uh, but to be very, you know, to be very explicit, when you read the code, it's very important to be as explicit as possible, even if it takes uh, more space. We would do what? We just specify x, y, z, and lambda. And I think this is going to work. OK, it did work. OK. And we don't want to see any of this, right? I mean, it's a. Ah. I mean, okay. So now what happened? Now it found that that uh, points x, y, and z, right, as a function of the parameter. Okay. So now we can perform sensitivity. So we can take the derivative of that, of the x, y, and the z. Now these are the hats, right? X hat. Let's let's display x hat, right? And notice that you may have multiple solutions, in which case you may have to chop and then only get the ones that are you're interested in. For instance, the maximum, right? Then what would you have to do? I don't know. Isolate only the first component, right? So there's a bit of you know. Um, post processing, if you want, after each, after after this, uh, you know, after figuring out what the command you need, you have to do some uh, post processing. For instance, you will see this in this code, which is constrained color TV problem. <coughs> Sometimes I get, well, okay, I didn't do the sensitivity here, but remember one step that we didn't do at all on our uh, simplified example is we didn't compute the value, the maximum value, right? So we have to also to, uh, to evaluate y, I mean the whatever the function is, at the maximum, at the points where we found it to be maximum or minimum. And that's done with substitutes, subs. Okay, so So this is this is the same thing here. So let me just say very quickly, what was this constraint for for color TV problem? It was basically the same um, profit fun uh, was building up the same profit function, but now the constraint was that you wanted um, the pr the total production not to exceed a certain amount. So that was the constraint, and initially the const uh, con the total number of of um, of units was ten thousand, right? So let's run this and see what what happens. I'm going to do it cell by cell so we can. Oops. Okay, so. 
just a fancy way to display. Again, the is the same function as as, as in the unconstrained. But now we have our constraint that says um, here I say plot plot easy plot g where g I define it to be x1 plus x2 minus 10,000. So the sum cannot exceed 10,000. So this basically ch um, I don't know of a nice way to just erase uh, what's not in the feasible set, right? Or in the admissible set. So we don't we don't want anything that's above this line, okay? In particular, we don't want that maximum that occurs when there is a unconstrained optimization, right? If you remember, the maximum was 7,000 and 4,000, so that was above, was 11,000. So if you have a cap on the production, this means you cannot achieve that, that optimal, that maximum value of the profit because of this constraint. So you have to kind of, you know, come down and say, uh, I'm going to, Look for a maximum in this in this case in the lower triangle, right? And because of the color bar, you see where the maximum is going to actually uh, sit, right? Where is it going to sit? On the boundary, because inside there's no solution. Inside of this region, this triangle, there's no uh, gradient that you know where the gradient is zero. There's no critical point. So you have to look on the boundary. Well. We don't really have to look on this boundary or on that boundary. I mean, we actually do, but we saw it on the graph that it's, well, you can see it by the colors, right? That's not very correct to say, but uh, you can see that it has to happen on that boundary. So, so that's why uh, you do the constraint optimization with x1 plus x2 equals 10,000. And let's see, did we? Oh, yeah, so we actually... I don't know where, but it got computed. I think in the previous one here, yep. So it got computed. You see the 3,800, 600, 1,000, 6,100. 6, um, it computed the optimal, well, with this constraint, what's the optimal profit? And what else? It actually computed the lambda hat. Okay? So it all got computed here, right? Yeah, everybody's good with this? And then it just kind of displayed the... Remember when it's done symbolically, you see where weird things and you, you want to get it in numerical format. Yeah. Oh, yeah, bank format is it gives you only two decimals. Yeah, so there's all kinds of formats you can choose for uh, display. I mean, you don't want four decimals. I mean, maybe, but... Uh, and once you write this, everything uh, next is going to come in, in bank format unless you change it again. Yeah? I don't know. It doesn't make a difference here much. Um, probably truncated. Okay. All right, and then it, it makes this the kind of plot which... Would it just? I think it just adds the. Oh yeah, it actually adds. What does it add? Adds the the level curve. Where of 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 the of f right. It just kind of um, displays the le displays the level curve. That it's tangent to the constraint, right? Right? See the level curves of F? They're not tangent with the constraint. But where the level curve is tangent, that's where the two normal, the two gradients get to be parallel. Right? Okay. Anyway, that's just a visual thing. Uh, but let's let's go to the sensitivity. Well, so one sensitivity that I do is not with respect to the constraint itself, but with respect to one of those parameters that was in the I don't know, price elasticity, right? So again, A uh, comes before, uh, in the alphabet, comes before. So, so when you get to solving, what do you see here? Did I specify? I didn't even specify because 
A comes before lambda L in the alphabet, right? But this wasn't very prudent. It, this wasn't very, right? In other words, if you cop modify the, this code for whatever problem, you have to be very careful how you call the parameters, right? If it's N, it's bad, right? Not bad, but you have to specify comma, x1, x2, and lambda. Otherwise, it's going to give something wrong. Okay, so here, let me just run this with respect to A. So something happened. Oh, yeah, uh, it's, I don't know why it displays this whole thing, but it showed me the sensitivity of y to that parameter. Okay? And it's negative, meaning meaning with an increase in, in, in value of A comes a decrease in the optimal profit. Now notice that the, the region has not changed. For this for this parameter A, the region is uh, the region where the you know the constraint doesn't change, right? But the maximum still can change. The maximum, the point where the maximum occurs, will change, right? And therefore, the actual maximum value will change with respect to that parameter. And that's what happens. But it moves along that constraint. The constraint hasn't moved. Whereas this one C, which I showed you before, the constraint changes, right? The function doesn't change. The constraint changes. And what happens with the maximum? In this case, I call it y. It really should be y hat. OK? So this is the value at the maximum. That's the maximum value for depending as a function of c, right? You know, take a look at this. Uh, I do sensitivity, but I don't actually do that uh, ratio of relative changes. I just do the ratio of change of, of exact cha of, of changes. So it's just dy dc, and take a look at what the value that I get. I get this number twenty-four, which says nothing. I mean, what does this say in effect? Interpretation. Again, this is ratio of, of delta y over delta c when c is small. So delta c is small, take it to be 1. Okay, So you had 10,000, a cap on production. And now let's say it's 10,001. If it is just 1 added, right? That's a pretty small change. You agree with that? That causes a change in the profit and the optimal profit to be 24, I think, dollars, right? Meaning, what does it mean? It means that if you allow an increase in production uh, capacity, an increase in capacity by one unit, your profit is going to go up by $24. What is, that, what is that supposed to say? Well, that says that when you, when you plan your produ uh, production capacity, you will ask yourself, is it going to cost me more or less than $24 to increase that capacity? If it's going to cost me less than $24, then maybe I should plan the capacity to have that extra unit so that the profit will be increased. Right? So this is called shadow price. So that's why this derivative is called shadow price. It's, it's, a, pri it's a shadow price for that extra unit. Because if it costs less to produce that extra unit, this profit is going to actually, uh, I mean, it's going to be profitable to produce that extra unit, right? So this is one thing. That's the, that's the interpretation of this uh, derivative with respect to the constraint parameter. Okay. On the other hand, I don't know if you remember when we display the lambda, we actually got 24, lambda to be 24. So there's no, um, 
there's no coincidence. So in my other handout, which I um, uh, gave it to you here, um, the computation there is a computation that actually shows that the shadow price always matches the the, the, the Lagrange multiplier. And computation is very simple, so I'll just instead of writing it down, I'll just uh, put it here. I'll just display it. Let's follow this one. So the hat, remember, co corresponds to the, the point where the maximum with constraints occurs, right? Assuming the constraint, the, the maximum occurs on the constraint line, on the, on the, on the border. Okay, so take, what is this? Uh, this is the actual maximum value, right, as a function of it's, it's the value of, of the maximum of the um, ob objective function evaluated at this critical point, right? And this is a function of that constrained parameter, okay, value of the constraint. Again, the um, chain rule, just like we did, you know, when, in the unconstrained, is this plus this. There's no, there's no additional term, right? Because the function doesn't depend on C, Right? The optimization function is, doesn't, doesn't depend on the constraint value. That's why there's no extra C. Now, take, you take this. So all of this is computed at a point where the maximum occurs. So this means that the partial of f with respect to x1 is lambda times partial of g with respect to x1. And so is the second partial with respect to uh, x2. Right? So this lambda comes up uh, in front. And what do you get? In the end, you get lambda, and the reason is the quantity inside here is nothing but it's 1 because this is what the constraint is. The constraint is actually G evaluated at the, at the point you know, where the maximum occurs e is actually C. So when you differentiate the spec to C, you get 1. Okay. So now you see, right? This is shadow price with that interpretation. If it's, it's not always, I mean, it's, you don't necessarily have production costs and, and capacities. I mean, you could have other interpretations. But this is the shadow price, and this is the Lagrange multiplier. And uh, of course, when, when they when do sensitivity to other parameters and not the constraint parameter, then is the previous computation that plays a role, where you have you have uh, also partial of y with respect to a in it, right? So then it's no longer the, there's no direct relationship between lambda and but then you don't call that shadow price because shadow price is with respect to the constraint. Okay. So. This should clarify sort of this example. Now, when you get to your problems, you still have to go through that first step, which is the most difficult, right? Digesting the problem. If it's a newspaper problem, you just have to sit there and imagine yourself being in charge with that newspaper. Uh, the problem that I assign is has what? So try. Yeah, number six. Number five is unconstrained. Number six is. Sorry about that. Personal computers. Okay, so you just have to put yourself in skin of a of somebody that is is going to plan, you know, design this thing, and see what the constraints are. Put everything right. The good news is going to be two. I think two variables. So, um, but you you try to kind of make the computer help you out in this because by hand it would be uh, impossible, right? So try to do this and let me know on Wednesday how how it goes, okay? Monday is due Monday. I'll, I'll I'll update the website, okay? But don't don't wait till Sunday because you're gonna have problems with your code. All right, thank you.